Seated. So guess whose anniversary it is today? Terry and Laurel's 35th anniversary today. Let's give them a big hand. 35 years you're getting old, Terry. Laurel's not getting old, but you're getting old, Terry. Guess, guess who married him, too? Pastor Bruce back there 35 years ago. How about, how about that? These kids, they're, they're growing up here. Yeah, so <laughs> congratulations to you today. I, I have to begin this year with a confession. There was a part of me that was hoping that it would be a low attendance Sunday and that maybe there would be very few people in the front rows that could see my blotchy face, how badly I've been beat up here this week. I know what some of you are thinking is, man, it looks like Dan had kind of a rough New Year's here. Looks like he may be tangled with Cindy, and Cindy won. But, of course, you know I'm way smarter than to tangle with Cindy. She's got a black belt in Taekwondo. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, way, I'm a very obedient husband. But, yes, Happy New Year to all of you, and uh, we hope you survived the holidays. In fact, more than survived the holidays, we hope you thrived through the holidays, and we hope you thrive in this new year. And I'm sure you'd agree with me that the best way to thrive in this new year and to thrive in this new decade is to know Jesus better. All the talk about New Year's resolutions, let's resolve as the people of God to know Jesus better. Isn't that a great resolution? To know Jesus better, to draw closer to Jesus. And that is the best way to thrive and to enjoy and know the fullness of God. And so I'm happy to be returning to our Portraits of Jesus series based on the Gospel of John. You recall that Pastor Amy last preached on John 14, and that was right before Advent. And John 14 is a very important chapter there where Jesus has one of those famous I am sayings, another I am saying coming up this next week. But Jesus in John 14 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If I were to ask you what is probably the most popular, well-known verse in all of Scripture, what would you say? Probably John, John 3, 16. That's what came up last night, too. And most of us have, me, have that memorized, maybe the, the King James Version, for God's love the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Probably a second verse in all of Scripture that is foundational and important for us to memorize is John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Think about that a moment. That puts Jesus in a pretty unique position, doesn't it? No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus is the way to salvation. So that sets the stage for what we asked you to read this week, the second half of chapter 14, where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. So let's open up our Bibles. Maybe you still have it open from reading it just a moment ago, where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit the second half of this chapter. You'll find this on page 1548. Page 1548, and let's begin with verse 15 and read verse 15 together where Jesus says this, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Let's stop right there. We learn right at the very beginning of this passage here that Jesus teaches that actions speak louder than words. You'll see on the sign in front of the church, I think it still says, love came down, and that was our big theme for Advent and Christmas. But what is Jesus talking about here? He's not talking about love coming down. He's talking about us loving him. If you love me, you will obey what I command. It's, it's a conditional statement there. And maybe the word obey is a little bit intimidating or a little bit threatening. I think you'd maybe agree with me that obedience has kind of fallen on hard times in our modern era. Dogs go to obedience school. Slaves obey their masters. We've even stricken in, in modern times, at least in the, even in the green hymn book, we no longer promise at the altar to love and obey. Unless your wife has a black belt in Taekwondo, then you, then you obey. But we, we, we talk about loving and cherishing. We promise to love and cherish. But Jesus here talks about love and obeying. So take a look at the study note in the margin there, just to the left. It says, what comes first, obedience or love? And it says, love and obedience are accompanied by one another. Loving God and obeying him are a single package. To love him is to obey him, and to obey him is to love him. Properly practiced, each demonstrates the other. A lot of talk in recent years about fake news. 
Jesus seems to be saying there is such a thing as fake love. And there's such a thing as fake faith. It may very well be that we say we love Jesus, but our actions demonstrate something totally different. And so it's important that our actions, that we, that we obey. And how does Jesus talk about uh, commandments? He, he summarizes the commandments by saying the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second greatest commandment is what? To love our neighbors as ourselves. So Jesus teaches that actions speak louder than words. In the email that we sent out on Friday, I suggested that we think of this passage here as kind of a farewell speech. As Jesus has just told the disciples earlier that he would be leaving them, and so their hearts are troubled and afraid because he's going to be leaving them. I remember one time when my parents were leaving for a short trip. I was in high school. I was the oldest of four kids. So they left a little note, and I remember that it said this. It said, remember who you are. And I've often thought, you know, that was probably more effective than if they would have left a long list of don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that. Remember who you are. And similarly, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so I'm reminded of uh, a very deep insight that Lucas shared with us. Maybe it was a year ago or two years ago. We're hearing a lot about New Year's resolutions at this time of the year. How many of you have been thinking about New Year's resolutions a little bit, maybe? And so I remember that Lucas, maybe was it last year or two years ago, Lucas, that you shared this deep insight with us. Leave it to Lucas to leave us a deep insight that he had discovered this, that just joining a health club doesn't help you lose weight. Do you remember that? He had discovered you have to go to the health club and work out at the health club if you want to lose weight. Darn, who knew? Similarly, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. So as we begin a new year, let's pause for a moment and consider what that might mean for our lives. If it's true, if it's true that we love Jesus and if it's more than just words... And if we're more than just going through the motions, how does that shape our life? How does that change us if we love Jesus? And how does that show? If we love Jesus, it should show, right? And so how might it show with the way that we use our time? Well, you're here. That's good. You took the time to be here today. So it shows that you love Jesus. I mean, you could be going through the motions, but we'll give you the benefit of the doubt that you're here because you want to show that you love Jesus. And, and if we love Jesus, how might that shape the way we use our talents and how we prioritize using our talents? And if we love Jesus, how might that shape our treasure and our spending habs, habits and our spending priorities? Does it show the way we spend our money and manage our money and prioritize our money? Does it show that we love Jesus? Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So the bad news is that Jesus is leaving his disciples. The good news is he's not leaving them alone. So let's pick it up with verse 16, the very next verse here in this section. In verse 16, it says this. Let's read it together. He says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. In other words, Jesus promises the help of the Holy Spirit. As Pastor Bruce knows, the Greek word for for counselor here is paraclete. Sometimes it's translated helper in some translations. Sometimes it's translated comforter. Um, I I like counselor because I think today we have more respect for counselors than we used to have. In the old days, we would sometimes make snotty comments and we'd say, so and so seen a shrink which is really a snotty thing to say. And maybe if we were saying something that snotty, we maybe needed to see a shrink. But I think it's well respected today that that we sometimes go to a counselor when we're in need of some help. So how cool is it that Jesus promises a free counselor that is available anytime, that is never too busy, 
to give us direction in life. It maybe was about 10 years ago or 20 years ago that we started to hear a lot of talk about spiritual direction. And so people were encouraged to, to hook up with a spiritual director. And maybe that was less threatening than, than going to a pastor and receiving some pastoral guidance or pastoral care. But now today we don't hear so much about spiritual direction. You know what the in thing is today? If you're, if you're in, you, you, you would know this. The in thing today is coaches, life coaches. We hear a lot on the internet about life coaches. People are looking for coaches, somebody to help them with direction in life. And I think that is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So think about this. Perhaps if Jesus were saying this today, he would say it this way. He would say, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another coach to be with you forever. So we are, we are invited to listen to the coaching and the direction and the help of the Holy Spirit. The good news is that Jesus leaves us a helper. He doesn't leave us for, forlorn or orphaned, as some translations say. But he gives us a helper. But the bad news is we're not often listening. Jesus offers free counseling available anytime to provide guidance in life, but we're often not listening. So think about some of the things that distract us today. I think one of the first things that maybe comes to mind are these things today. Everywhere we go, we see these things, and even in meetings, we see these things. You know, people are sitting in meetings, and they're, uh, you know, I'm paying attention here. I'm just looking some things up in the middle of the meeting, or maybe we'll, we'll get sneakier, and we'll put it down on the table, and then when we think nobody's looking, we'll glance at it real quickly here. And I don't mean to demonize smartphones today because I think every generation has had its distractions. It, when I was growing up, it was television. And parents were convinced that television was the bane of existence. And my dad would come in and say, are you watching that thing again? Are you watching that boob tube again? Do you remember, your, did your dad say boob tube too? There were no sexual connotations for that in that day. It was, but, but every generation has its distractions, doesn't it? Those things that make it hard for us to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. There are studies coming out about how much damage cell phones are doing to our young people today. And their attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. And their social skills are suffering. It is harder and harder for them to know how to look people in the eye and to have a face-to-face -face conversation. And so we need to consider about how, how we can say no to some of the distractions in life that make it harder for us to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. In fact, let's just, as we begin a new year, let's just take a minute to think about that and to pray about that. I mean, Jesus has just promised the Holy Spirit that would help us. So let's take a moment. Let's pray about that. Dear God... Dear God, right now, we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to be bold and honest with what distractions in our lives do we need to say no to? What distractions do we need to back off of? Is it our phones? Is it the television? Is it sports? Is it, is, is it work itself? What, what is it that's getting in the way of hearing your voice better? As we begin a new year, as we begin a new decade, May we, may we slow down and listen. Listen to you, for you have promised a helper, a counselor available at any time to lead and guide us in life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesus promises a counselor. The bad news is that we're oftentimes not listening. But Jesus then goes on, notice, he goes on to describe the mystery and the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Let's pick it up at the very bottom of the page, verse 26, and read verse 26 together as a congregation. Verse 26 says this, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. In other words, Jesus describes the beauty and the mystery of the Trinity right here. Now, did you see the word Trinity in there? Look again. Where's the word Trinity? Oh, we don't see it. Do we see the word Trinity anywhere in the Bible? No, we don't see it. But how can you miss the Trinity in this verse? Take a look at it again. 
But the counselor of the Holy Spirit, okay, there's one person of the Trinity, whom the Father, there's another person of the Trinity, will send in my name, there's the third person of the Trinity, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Churches today will now oftentimes proudly say, we just preach Jesus in this church. We're all about Jesus. Our total, total focus is on Jesus. And I told you a couple years ago about a good friend of mine who I love and respect, how he said, if we're not talking about Jesus, we're off topic. And I thought, oh, what a cool expression. I wish I would have thought of that. If we're not talking about Jesus, we're off topic. But then I started to notice in Scripture that Scripture gets off topic a lot, that the Apostle Paul gets off topic topic a lot as he talks about God the Father, as he talks about living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and, and, and leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself, if we're, talking about, if we're not talking about Jesus, we're off topic. Jesus himself gets off topic, doesn't he? Such as this passage here as he talks about God the Father, whom I will send in my name, the, the counselor, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name. Um, I, we, we do, of course, want to be Christocentric. There's a good million-dollar word for you. Let's say it together, Christocentric. Christocentric. Now, what does it mean? Well, you can figure out what it means. It means to be Christ-centered. We do want to be Christ-centered. Martin Luther himself said that all of Scripture is the cradle of Christ. So we do want to be Christ-centered. But we don't want to be so Christ-centered that we, we miss the fullness of of God. Think about that for a moment. Here's, 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 a, here's an analogy, and it's so simple, I'm a little embarrassed to use it, but it would be almost as if after a football game, we were to only talk about the quarterback. I mean, maybe the quarterback had a great game, but still, even if the quarterback had a great game, I think any quarterback worth his salt would agree it takes a team. It takes a team effort, a full team effort. And if anybody on the team breaks down in a big way, the quarterback's going to be in trouble. So similarly, we don't want to be so Christocentric that we miss out on the fullness of God. So Jesus clearly calls our attention to how the Trinity works in verse 26 here. He says, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Some, most of you know that I was a PK, a preacher's kid growing up in Fremont, Nebraska. And as a PK growing up in Fremont, Nebraska, I noticed as a little kid that there were, there were people that did this crossing the heart thing. And then I soon learned that the people that did this crossing the heart thing were, were Catholics. And so maybe there's a few of you here that have Catholic backgrounds. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm kind of poking fun at Lutherans here. And so imagine my shock and my amazement and my surprise when I went to Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, of all things, the seminary that my dad went to, and they said this crossing the heart thing isn't just for Catholics. What? I thought for sure that was just for Catholics. No, no, this crossing the heart thing is for all of us. It's for all of us to remember who we are and who we belong to. And so they encouraged us to do this crossing the heart thing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so I, you know, I dutifully tried to, tried to learn that and practice that. And I have to admit, as a, as a PK growing up in Fremont, Nebraska, I felt a little weird with this crossing the heart thing. I felt like, like one of those Catholics. People are going to think I'm a Catholic here. And we wouldn't, God forbid, we wouldn't want that to happen. But you know what? Here, here's, here's what I found through the years. I, I, I've, I've grown more and more fond of it and, it, and and it has become more and more powerful for me, especially in those moments where I'm feeling down, in those moments where I'm feeling blue, in those moments where I'm feeling like I just don't measure up and that I'm just not good enough. How, what, what a beautiful reminder of who we belong to, that we have been claimed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that we have been claimed in holy baptism and that, and that God makes that claim on us forever. We belong to him forever. And, and you know what? None of us measure up. None of us are good enough. That's the very point of crossing ourselves is to remember that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son to go to the cross. That's the point of crossing ourselves is to remember it's the cross that saves. So we're reminded here with Jesus' words that it's the cross that saves 
But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and I will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus beautifully describes the mystery of the Holy Spirit here. Let's close with verse 27, right at the very bottom of the page here. This was Cindy's confirmation verse. How many of you had a confirmation verse? When you went to confirmation, okay. I, I'm sure I had a confirmation verse, but I don't remember what my confirmation verse was. Uh, we, we, it, it probably was Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. <laughs> and, and in fact, uh, Nanette and I finally had to make a rule. No more Jesus wept for confirmation and memory verses. Because it got a little weird on confirmation Sunday when you get about five boys in a row go, Jesus wept, Jesus wept, Jesus wept, Jesus wept, Jesus wept. Okay, can't use Jesus wept anymore. But this was Cindy, Cindy's confirmation verse. And I've always remembered this as Cindy's confirmation verse. Let's read it together. Jesus says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In other words, Jesus promises peace in the midst of a troubled world. Realtor, re, re, business people depend on a big December to have a successful year. They're hoping you and I will spend lots of money every December, and so probably lots of us got lots of stuff this Christmas, and, uh, and yet Jesus here gives us a priceless gift, the gift of peace. And notice he contrasts the peace that he gives with the peace that the world gives. We, we might feel a sense of satisfaction and gratitude and peace when we receive Christmas presents, but have you ever noticed how quickly that peace fades? I was with a friend this week, and he closed on a house, and he was all excited. Great relief, great sense of peace of mind and heart when the deal was closed, but, and, and we celebrated a little bit, but but we know that peace won't last because he's going to be really, really busy moving in the house and everything. That's the way the world's peace is. The world's peace doesn't last. Jesus promises a peace that lasts, the peace that passes all understanding. What a gift. That is a priceless gift in the midst of all the stuff that we might have received this Christmas. So the question is this. Jesus offers his peace. Are we ready to receive it? Are we open to it, to receive it. Jesus offers it to us. Jesus has paid the price, and we are invited to receive it. What a gift in the midst of a troubled world where how often it is easy for us to be troubled and afraid, as he says at the end of this verse. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we begin a new year and as we begin a new decade, that our hearts would not be troubled and afraid. We pray that in the midst of all the distractions of life, that we might receive your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. So how fascinating it is that two people can be going through the very same thing. They can be, both be losing a job or they can both be uh, fighting the same illness, and yet one person is troubled and afraid, and the other person is full of peace. We, we want to receive the peace that passes all understanding. So we, we, we pray, Lord Jesus, that this year, as we begin a new year, as we begin a new decade, that, that if we love you, it might show. It might show with the way that we use our time and the way that we use our talents and the way that we use our treasure that people would look at us and they would say, it shows that they love Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.